Welcome to the Jimi Hendrix story, as you've never heard it before. Episode 6, Early 1967 In the year of 1967, a monumental shift occurred in the realm of rock music. It marked a pivotal moment when everything fell into place, capturing the hearts of a generation of white middle-class youth who believed they could alter the course of the world through the power of flowers and psychedelic experiences. Hunter Thompson eloquently conveyed the prevailing sentiment of the time, stating, There was a fantastic universal sense that whatever we were doing was right, that we were winning. Our energy would simply prevail. We all had the momentum. We were riding the crest of a high and beautiful wave. 1967 witnessed a confluence of significant events and cultural milestones. It was the year that brought us the groundbreaking album Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band the mesmerizing Monterey Pop Festival, and the inaugural edition of Rolling Stone magazine. The Summer of Love blossomed, highlighted by the Human Being Gathering in San Francisco's Golden Gate Park. The music scene resonated with Scott McKenzie's anthem, San Francisco, Be Sure to Wear Flowers in Your Hair, and Procol Harum's timeless hit, A Whiter Shade of Pale. Fashion embraced caftans, bells, beads, and army greatcoats, while vibrant colors swirled through the air, emblazoned on posters and tie-dye t-shirts. London took the reins from Liverpool as the epicenter of the pop universe. With the emergence of influential cultural phenomena like the Apple Boutique, Hate ashbury Portobello Road, Pink Floyd's debut single and album, The UFO Club, Middle Earth, Oz Magazine, and International Times. This period of psychedelic wonder encompassed a blend of social critique, hedonism, and the popularization of Eastern spirituality, packaged for mass consumption, an ethereal mindset readily available and analyzed to the point of exhaustion. Yet amidst this vibrant facade, the machinery of the music industry continued to operate as usual. Admittedly, pinstriped suits made way for floral shirts and longer hair, and the word man flowed effortlessly from the lips of many a record company executive. However, while one hand clutched the joint, the other wielded the pen, extended to the next aspiring musician with the timeless offer, Just sign here, son, and we'll take care of the rest. Mike Jeffrey and his tricks Once Hey Joe had been released, Mike Jeffrey used his armory of dirty tricks to get the record noticed. In order to try and get Hey Joe into the UK charts, he employed the usual chart-rigging method of paying someone to buy records from the record shops that the UK chart compilers sampled to calculate record sales. This was called seed money. Trixie Sullivan, Mike Jeffrey's assistant, has said, There was a guy that used to come around. All the business used him. He knew all the record shops, so he would go around and buy records to make the numbers up. Mike Jeffrey also did a deal with the pirate radio stations to ensure that Hey Joe would get plenty of airplays. He traded a part of Hendrix's future publishing royalties in exchange for exposure, 2% to be precise. And so, the success of Hey Joe convinced Polydor to finance track records. On the 11th of January, Mike Jeffrey and Chaz Chandler signed a contract with Lambert and Stamp's production company, New Action. The contract stated that Jimi Hendrix was obliged to provide four singles and two albums for every year of the contract. The Jimi Hendrix experience was not signed directly to track records, and in fact, none of the band actually signed the New Action contract. The terms of the October 1966 contract that Mike Jeffrey and Chaz Chandler had agreed with the musicians left the pair free to arrange any production or publishing deals they saw fit. The production company contracts, however, put even more distance between the artist and the money. In this case, New Action paid Mike Jeffrey and Chandler an 8% royalty on record sales, but nothing to the band. And if that wasn't good enough, Mike Jeffrey did a side deal with Polydor, whereby all the rights to the Jimi Hendrix experience work would revert back to him and Chaz Chandler once the track deal had lapsed. The band members, however, were far from happy with the meager amounts of money coming their way. Operating on the smell of an oily rag While the Jimi Hendrix experience continued to score minor triumphs, such as placing Hey Joe on the charts and appearing on Ready Steady Go, their lack of cash flow dogged Chandler and Jeffrey. They claimed they had spent £10,000 so far, but had received nothing back in income. While they were playing almost every night through January in London, the pay was nominal. They had only enough money to pay for recording sessions at lesser-known studios, and even when they could record, 
They had to compromise, taking late nights or an hour or two at a reduced rate. We were doing clubs like the Seven and a Half Club for seven pounds, recalls Reading. Their transportation was even less glamorous. They drove themselves in Mitch's car, and I drove the van, says Jerry Stickles. Kathy Etchingham remembers the situation this way. It was weird that Jimmy actually had a hit record, and yet the money still hadn't filtered through. We had just enough to exist on, and a nice place to live when we were in London, but nothing more. It didn't matter. The breaks were coming. The people who knew about music now knew about Jimmy. However, fame and fortune were beginning to look inevitable, but the daily grind of touring was hard work, and a little spare cash would have made things a hell of a lot easier. Fortunately for the band, they had a timely and welcomed boost when Jimmy, Mitch and Noel each received a £20 bonus and a pay raise from £15 to £25 per week in mid-January, and then up to £30 in mid-February. Like most musicians, as Noel recounts, we hated to speak up, preferring to avoid any form of upset and concentrate on making music. The Look As Mitch recalls, Jimmy, from things I'd gathered, had always worn flamboyant clothes even as a kid. He told me he'd been suspended from junior high school once for wearing bright red trousers. Before he came over to London, I believe that most of his wardrobe had been seized by management of the hotel he was living in in New York because he couldn't pay the bill. He basically arrived here with a pair of trousers and one pair of shoes. The Burberry raincoat was, I suspect, what he thought he ought to wear in England. If Jimmy's appearance had attracted curious glances in London, he looked totally outrageous up north. Up there they might have heard of Carnaby Street and the King's Road and seen pictures of the fashions on television, but the clothes certainly hadn't reached the average high street. Men still had short back and sides haircuts and grey-brown clothes just like their fathers before them. Wherever we went we would hear low mutters like, Is that a girl or what? None of which bothered Jimmy at all. As long as they didn't become threatening, he enjoyed outraging people. Quite a few thought he was gay because of his appearance, although gayness was still an unheard-of concept in all but the most sophisticated corners of the country. And the words pansy and queer could be heard here and there. Jimmy probably didn't know what they meant, and if he did he certainly wasn't offended, being more confident of his sexuality than any man I had ever met. Mitch perm, he explains. In time, of course, I got my hair permed. Noel didn't have to bother, his was natural. For him it was a case of I get up in the morning and run my hands through my hair and the sparrows fly out. Hendrix was into Carmen hair rollers at that point, among other bits and pieces. Anyway, I used to come off stage wringing wet, couldn't do a thing with my hair which would be completely limp, and I thought, blow this, everyone else around here seems to have an easy time, I'll go and get it permed, at least you don't have to muck around. So I went to see this young lady who worked for a hairdresser, and was supposed to know what she was doing, and had a perm. Apparently what they should do is cut your hair first before you perm it. She didn't, and it ended up sticking out a mile. It was like Art Garfunkel. Expanded. Generally, though, it was much easier to deal with, and I guess it gave us an overall image, which was good for the mags and music media at that time. The Sex Symbol Kathy Etchingham explains, The media was starting to request interviews with Jimmy regularly by the time we got to Montague Square which meant that I had to be hidden, since a steady girlfriend would have damaged his sexy image. Jimmy was briefed never to mention me, and I would stay downstairs, usually in the bathroom, while he entertained the journalists above. It didn't bother me. I knew it was the way things were done. Chaz and Mike were trying to promote him as a sex symbol, an idea which made him very embarrassed if they discussed it in front of him since he wasn't someone who was comfortable strutting around like a peacock. He wanted to be much cooler, although his clothes made him seem flamboyant, and his highly charged sexuality was obvious to anyone who met him. Right from the beginning he had a style of his own, wearing satin shirts with voluminous sleeves, army jackets and bell-bottoms with scarves tied around the legs long before anyone else. Even Brian Jones was still wearing suits when Jimmy first arrived in London, and it was only later that other musicians started wearing flowery clothes, feather boas and jewellery. Jimmy was an original in his style. One of the first presents I bought him was a black shirt with roses on it which he wore all the time. It was very unusual then for him to wear anything so flamboyant. I remember finding it in a shop around Portobello Road. Jimmy loved it. The Savile Theatre Gig A beautiful old-fashioned theatre. The Savile was full to capacity. 
its audience aware of Hendrix and the experience from their important television appearances and press interviews. As was becoming the custom, the Beatles dropped by the group's dressing room before and after the gig, offering their support and admiration. Judging by the reception accorded them, the experience had truly arrived and were already on the verge of becoming, apart from the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, the biggest thing in England. Their compact 40-minute set included Killing Floor, Have Mercy, Can You See Me, Like a Rolling Stone, Rock Me Baby, Stone Free, Hey Joe, as well as a new addition, a charged rendition of the Trog's recent hit Wild Thing, complete with Hendrix thrusting the neck of his Fender Stratocaster against and through his legs and across the face of his battered Marshall 4X12 cabinets. This new and dynamic stage show was perfectly suited for larger venues such as the Savile. Hendrix was physically imposing as he played guitar. His act, even the way the group looked, was a clever combination of superior ability and an element of surprise capable of astonishing even the most seasoned rock and roll admirer. With most of his following too young to have seen Chuck Berry in his prime, the experience stunned audiences who had previously considered Keith Moon kicking over his drum kit, the consummate act of civil disobedience. Within the experience, there seemed an element far more threatening than England had ever before seen. For the Beatles, performing stock still incited rioting. For the Stones, Mick Jagger's gyrations whipped young girls into an uncontrolled frenzy, regardless of what either group was playing. With the experience, Hendrix had never played with this much passion and enthusiasm in his life, as each performance drained years of stagnation and frustration from him. His ability, stifled and suppressed behind such lesser talents as Curtis Knight and the Squires, expanded in an incredibly short time. He had won the total support and admiration of London's best musicians on the strength of rearranged blues and R&B standards. His only original composition to date, Stone Free, as brilliant as it was, was still only a B-side. Chandler's support and commitment to Hendrix challenged him into making the most of his first opportunity for public acceptance and success. Cream were in the audience that night listening to Jimmy. Eric Clapton later related to Rolling Stone how Jimmy's performance that night inspired Cream's most famous song, Sunshine of Your Love. In fact, Clapton described what happened as follows. He played this gig that was blinding. I don't think Jack Bruce had really taken him in before. I knew what the guy was capable of from the minute I met him. It was the complete embodiment of all aspects of rock guitar rolled into one. I could sense it coming off the guy. And when Jack did see it that night, after the gig he went home and came up with the riff. It was strictly a dedication to Jimmy, and then we wrote the song on top of it. Coincidentally, Jimmy used to play this same song as a dedication to Cream, one of his favourite bands, unaware that he was in fact playing his own dedication. Jimmy and Wild Thing. How it happened. The group was travelling north in the old van one dark day, the radio tuned to a pirate station, as it always was when they were on the road. They needed music wherever they went in those days. Cathy Etchingham, with feet up on the dashboard, was squeezed between Jimmy and Jerry Stickles, who was driving, when Wild Thing by the Trogs came on the air. Jimmy immediately turned up the volume just as the van bounced over a humpback bridge, sending the gear crashing around in the back. Wow, he laughed. Who's this? The Trogs, Jerry told him. Trogs. Jimmy looked puzzled. What kind of name is that? Kathy replied, trying to think of a decent explanation, said, Oh, they're a sort of little people who live in gardens. Then somewhat defensively, Kathy continued, Well, you believe you can stick pins in dolls or effigies of people you don't like, referring to Jimmy's belief in voodoo superstitions. As soon as they got back to London, he bought a copy and played it to himself a few times deciding to make a cover version which he could use in the stage show, and as we know, a rendition he would play triumphantly later that year at the Monterey Pop Festival. Let your fancy flow. This is Jimmy, in his own words. People ask me whether I dress and do my hair like this just for effect, but it's not true. This is me. I don't like to be misunderstood by anything or anybody. So if I want to wear a red bandana and turquoise slacks, and if I want hair down to my ankles, well, that's me. All those photographs you might have seen of me in a tuxedo and a bow tie playing in Wilson Pickett's backing group were me when I was shy, scared and afraid to be myself. 
I had my hair slicked back and my mind combed out. Jimmy goes on to say, People take us in strange ways, but I don't care how they take us. Man will be moving because in this life you've got to do what you want. You've got to let your mind and fancy flow, flow free. Exuding Charisma Not only did Hendrix have his own unique style and a belief in being yourself, he also exuded charisma and left an impression upon all those who met him. On New Year's Eve 1966, Jimmy, Kathy, Chaz and his girlfriend Lotta, along with Mitch Mitchell, all travelled down to Folkestone where Noel's mother, Margaret Redding, lived. Noel's sister Vicky came home the next day to visit her mother and recounted her meeting with Jimi Hendrix. I remember looking up the stairs and seeing Jimmy and the charisma. I couldn't take my eyes off him. He was so polite and charming and shy. Her mother agrees. The man had something special about him. When Jimmy was there, you couldn't look at anybody else. You could feel his presence. I like Jimmy very much indeed. There was always this warmth, she said. The Mixed Blessings of Stardom Noel Redding describes how as the band's success brought intended along with unintended consequences. Musically, we picked up steam daily, and press clippings piled up hourly. Even if you didn't like us, at least you could be sure of seeing someone. Keith Moon, a Beatle or a Stone, Liza Minnelli, Eric Clapton, Jane Asher, Marianne Faithful at our gigs. Last month we were playing to hundreds, this month thousands. Redding, always mindful of money, continues. It cost more in every way to hang out every night, but we had to relax and unwind from the shows. However, the unwinding soon became a wind-up as more and more people gravitated towards our aura of success. We had party invites every night, more drinking, more smoking and more pills for energy. Sleep was now reduced to two to six hours per night, if you went home or home alone. Then he goes on to say, The star treatment was overwhelming. No matter how much I dreamed about being a star, I'd never appreciated what a mixed blessing it would be. I loved being recognized, but hated being unable to claim a bit of privacy when I needed it, and I needed it more and more. Slowly, I began to realize just how much was expected of me and my time, just when I thought I'd paid my dues and could have some fun. He continues, You try to maintain two lives until you look for a focal point for your private self, then the realization hits that your previous life has been demolished. Everything has changed, even friends. Simple pleasures, a quiet pint and a chat, a good night's sleep, were gone. If I tried to go ice skating, I'd be pulled apart by schoolgirls, another lovely fancy that's better in the head. If I went to club, they'd announce my presence, applause, people rushing up for autographs, free drinks, women, etc. Getting a bag of chips became a production. My most wonderful dream was becoming the most nightmarish imposition. Plaza Newbury, Concert Review, War Turti. The band continued gigging in England through February and into March 1967. Journalists around the country were awestruck. Nobody had quite seen anything like it before, and this review was typical. Last night at the Plaza, Newbury, the Jimi Hendrix experience roared and romped their way through an hour and a quarter's worth of music that shattered the senses both orally and visually. Resplendent in red corduroy trousers and antique waistcoat, Jimmy proceeded to show just how many positions it was possible to play the guitar in, at the same time showing his very own professional skill, which must rate him as one of the most outstanding newcomers on the scene, since Jeff Beck and Eric Clapton. Outstanding for the experience on drums was Mitch Mitchell. Throughout the evening, Jimmy showed flashes of onstage humour, for which he must be given full credit. Hey Joe! was introduced as being written by Mickey Mouse. After a sudden frenzy of excitement in which he attacked his amplifier with his guitar, not a new idea but somehow done refreshingly, he announced, Anyone want to buy an old guitar? This one doesn't tune so well. The finish came suddenly, in an excess of violence. Mitch Mitchell attacked a cymbal stand and it broke into pieces, then distributed his drum kit round the stage and finally squirted the other two with a handy water pistol. The bass guitarist locked his guitar in its case and then kicked it about over the stage. Jimmy attacked his huge amplifier with his guitar, breaking all the strings and nearly toppling the amplifier onto his hand. He then squatted on the guitar with both feet and rocked to and fro. Thus the evening came to its conclusion in a storm of feedback, flying microphones and water pistols. 
Jimmy's songwriting. In the early days, with Hendrix and Chandler sharing an apartment, the creative relationship between artist and producer continued to grow outside of the studio. As Chaz recalls, in the initial stages, I changed a lot of the lyrics. Jimmy would come up with a lyric and I would make suggestions. In general, editing them down. Jimmy's songs tended to be six or seven minutes long and we would get them down to three or four minutes. We all felt that we improved them. The basic thing was editing. I was acting as if I was the editor of a newspaper, getting everything concise. The recordings for the first Jimi Hendrix Experience LP, Are You Experienced, were made during 16 recording sessions in London. The first day of recording being the 23rd of October, 1966, and the last, the 4th of April, 1967. As Mitch Mitchell recalls, Despite the presence of a fair amount of experimentation in the studio, Are You Experienced was live experience on record. Most of the songs we did live, some only occasionally like Manic Depression and Third Stone from the Sun, but as a whole it became the basis of the live act for some time to come. There were a few we didn't do live, such as Remember and May This Be Love, because in all honesty they were album fillers, not because we couldn't recreate them on stage. We really were a band at that time. Hendrix would have an idea of chords and structure. He wrote songs. When it came to the rhythmic structure, everything was left up to me and Noel. Noel complained over the years that he didn't want to be told what to play, but things were actually more flexible than that. Jimmy would say to him, this is the way the song goes. These are the notes that are available, but around that structure you can play what you want. There isn't much left over from the first two albums in terms of outtakes or different versions, purely because of the way we worked. There was incredible pressure on us, the cost of studio time and the fact that by early 1967 we were touring so much. But there are some things. There are a few songs that I, and apparently Noel as well, had completely forgotten about. Completely surprised me. I only heard them once a couple of years ago. They sounded rough warts and all, but I enjoyed them. Hopefully they will see the light of day. The ones I heard were Hendrix Originals but I know it's rumoured that we did a studio version of Like a Rolling Stone. Now I don't remember it, but it makes sense that we should have recorded it early on. The fact that I'd forgotten these other songs means that things like Rolling Stone might exist, but I just don't know. Hendrix was certainly a huge Dylan fan, and he turned me on to Dylan. Jimmy had this to say about it. First off, I don't want people to get the idea it's a collection of freakout material. I've written songs for teeny boppers like Can You See Me and Blues Things. Manic Depression is so ugly you can feel it, and May This Be Love is a kind of get-your-mind-together track. Imagination is very important. Our music cannot be categorized. Free form is the way to explain our sound, unrestricted and uninhibited creative expression. For While Chas Chandler added the following. The You Experienced to album was the first time where we found ourselves with a bit of time. We just fucked about with the equipment, really. We tried putting two and three instruments through a compressor and see what the hell would come out the other end, things like that. If it worked, we would edit it into the track or something. We'd do anything we could think of just for the fun of it, any daft idea that came along. Jimmy changed music, but who influenced him? Mitch discussing Jimmy's guitar influences. Olympic was also a great place to experiment. One of the things that attracted Hendrix to working in England was that he'd heard the sounds that people like Jeff Beck, whose playing we all loved, were producing with fuzz boxes and wanted to work in English studios. Jeff was already known, quite rightly, as one hell of a player. In fact, I didn't realize for a while how many English players Jimmy had heard, including at the time, less well-known ones like Peter Green. Green, in fact, gave Hendrix a great run for his money and was one of the few guitarists who wasn't in awe of him. You know, he didn't say, Oh God, I've seen Hendrix, I'm gonna die. Jimmy was so receptive, and he really learned a lot from English players. He also taught me a lot. In the early days, he turned me on to a lot of blues, like Robert Johnson. My blues background had been much more jazz-oriented. People like King Pleasure and Mose Allison. I knew about Muddy Waters and those people, but it took Hendrix to turn me on to the other stuff. If it had have been an English blues purist like John Mayle, telling me all this, I doubt if I'd have listened. 
but being as it was Hendrix and he'd been through all of that, I did. Also, he always did it in a very delicate way, just pointing out certain reference points. And it was reciprocal. I'd say, well, try this, and I'd play him Roland Kirk or Miles Davis or even a bit of Coltrane. It wasn't that we were picking each other's brains. It wasn't a self-conscious kind of process. With Noel, it was usually air. Have you heard the new Small Faces record? For all the years we were on the road, Noel had a Small Faces album and a Birds album and a portable record player. We always knew which hotel room he was in. Taking care of business. At the start of 1967, Mike Jeffrey traveled to the States in search of an American recording contract for the Jimi Hendrix experience. He also wanted to extract Jimi Hendrix from the contracts he'd got into before coming to England. Once in America, Mike Jeffrey employed a firm of lawyers to sort out the messy contracts and to try and secure a U.S. record deal. The lawyers managed to resolve some of the contractual issues by buying off various individuals and by obtaining the rights to seven songs that Hendrix had recorded as a backing musician in 1965 while under contract. One of the lawyers working on behalf of Mike Jeffrey also secured a record deal for the Jimi Hendrix experience with Warner Brothers. The contract bypassed the band and was actually between Reprise Records and Yameta. Yameta was required to provide recordings embodying the performance of Jimi Hendrix or the Jimi Hendrix experience. Hendrix, Redding and Mitchell were not obliged to sign anything because they themselves were already exclusively tied to Yameta. As part of the agreement, Yameta and not Warner Brothers was to retain the ownership of the master recordings. With a $150,000 deal, a royalty advance of $40,000 and a promotional budget of $20,000, this was an excellent outcome. Well, for Mike Jeffrey and Chaz Chandler at least. Stay tuned for Episode 7. The European Tour, Amsterdam TV, Purple Haze, Chandler talking about Dylan, like a rolling stone, Jimmy talking about Motown, and Letters to Fans, plus much more.